Thanks, Jessica. Um, so as Jessica mentioned, um, I'm going to primarily be responding to Dr. Williams Eris's by Alice Notley, but I'm actually going to begin with two poems by Williams. Après le bain. I gotta buy me a new girdle. I'll buy you one. Okay. I wish you'd wiggle that way for me. I'd be a happy man. I got a wiggle for this, you pig. Chinese Nightingale. Long before dawn, your light shone in the window, Sam Wu. You were at your trade. I like Williams, <laughs> but so often he makes me uncomfortable. And the topic of Williams and the women does too, though not always because of, women, of Williams himself, and not always because of his work. Assessments of Williams, like Alice Notley's Dr. Williams' heiresses, often give me pause. In this lecture, published in 1980, Notley writes, Poe was the first one. He mated with a goddess. His children were Emily Dickinson and Walt Whitman, out of wedlock with a goddess. Then Dickinson and Whitman mated. Since they were half divine, they could do anything they wanted to, and they had two sons, William Carlos Williams and Ezra Pound, and a third son, T.S. Eliot, who went to a faraway country and never came back. From out of the West came Gertrude Stein, the daughter of the guy who wrote the 800-page novel and the girl who thought, maybe rightly, that she was Shakespeare. Gertrude Stein and William Carlos Williams got married. Their two legitimate children, Frank O'Hara and Philip Whalen, often dressed and acted like their uncle Ezra Pound. However, earlier, before his marriage to Gertrude Stein, Williams had a child by the goddess Brooding. His affair with Brooding was long and passionate, and his child by her was oversized, Charles Olson. Before Charles Olson's birth, the goddess had also been having an affair with William's brother, Ezra Pound. No one was ever absolutely sure who the father of Olson was. And it goes on until Notley writes, there were no females in this generation, and the first children of the male females of Olson and of their other brothers were all males. And there were very many of them because, their father, because of their father's incredible promiscuity. But the male females also produced a second wave of children, of which there were many females. These females could not understand how they came to be born. They saw no one among their parents and brothers who resembled them physically, for the goddesses their fathers mated with were evaporative, non-parental types. This lecture is nearly 30 years old. It was written and published before I was born before my mother immigrated to Canada. I came up in a different academy than Notley did, reading a different set of texts than she did, a set that at some point would include texts by Notley herself. But for many years, I was reading a set of texts quite other than those listed in her genealogy. And one effect of being so much younger than Notley and younger than Dr. Williams' heiresses is that the version of academia in which I was educated, the version of English literature that I experienced, was one that had been profoundly shaped by feminism. Part of the reason why Dr. Williams' heiresses is such an odd reading experience for me is that it is a text of this other time, of this other sense of literature and literary history. If I were Alice Notley, it might have gone this way. Williams was not the first one. He got there late. If there were goddesses, they were mating before he arrived. First out of wedlock, and then later, I suppose, in it when they could. There was Margaret Lawrence. She wrote novels about the sound of geese's wings when they flew overhead south. There was Atwood. She wrote about a fat girl who wrote novels, sometimes wore a lace tablecloth, and then you knew it was experimental. And she knew it too, but felt silly about it. 
There was Carol Shields, whose novel had pictures in it, a family in black and white. The mothers of these goddesses were sisters, Catherine Parr Trail and Susanna Moody. They were genteel English people until they found themselves having to be something else. Then they wrote books with recipes and poems and frustration, books like Roughing It in the Bush. The goddesses thought about this, but felt ashamed of these mothers too. They thought about their mothers being genteel English people. They thought about the recipes and poems and frustration. They thought about their mothers coming from this faraway country. And in their novels, they sent people there. And the people stood on the beach and held hands in the pockets of greatcoats and felt disconnected. But before these goddesses, there were others. There was Jean Anouy, who wrote Antigone. There was Jacques Prévert, who asked Barbara to remember how il pleuvait sans cesse sur Brest ce jour-là. There was Maupassant. But there were also Gabriel Roy, Marie-Claire Blais, Anne Hébert, Nicole Brossard. They might have been mating. But it was never clear whether they were mating with the others who might have been goddesses, though some of them did seem to have met and seemed to have spoken to each other. So I went to that faraway country, and then I went to another. Not exactly on the beach, but near it, there were people standing in a group together. They might have been goddesses. Someone pointed out the constellations and pointed to one where the goddesses in it hadn't done quite the things that those goddesses I knew had done. Gertrude Stein, Mina Loy, Barbara Guest, Susan Howe, Bernadette Mayer, Rachel Blau Duplessis, Lynn Higinian, Harriet Mullen, Lisa Robertson, Erin Moray. They were writing about other things than the sound of geese and Antigone and how il pleuvait sans cesse sur Brest ce jour-là. We all stood there, not quite in the beach, with our hands in our own pockets. Then every now and then someone would point. Marianne Moore, H.D., Gwendolyn Brooks, Carolyn Bergvall, Tracy Morris. Sometimes they seemed to be up among the constellations, and then suddenly you would notice that you were standing among them and that there they were, pointing at something themselves. Someone pointed at Williams, T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, Wallace Stevens. They pointed at a red wheelbarrow that I didn't remember seeing before, but that nevertheless looked very familiar. Here's where that narrative breaks down. It's hard to describe it as if I were Notley. It doesn't make sense for me to call anyone a goddess, and I didn't experience literary history as a series of fathers and evaporative non-parental types, secret women writers that nobody thought to record, who didn't really matter in tracing poetic lineages anyway. Chalk it up to a success of feminism, I never learned modernism or any part of literature without the ladies in it. But I didn't, I didn't experience the history of literature as a series of hetero matings either. I didn't want parents in the writers I read, and I didn't want to fall in love with a literary father, like Notley describes in her lecture. And Williams was a late entry onto the scene for me, someone whom I didn't really consider until I was well into my MA. I don't think of my influences as drawn exclusively from American modernism. Perhaps this is a misunderstanding of Notley's claim in Dr. Williams' heiresses, but it's funny that in drawing up the family tree of her poetic lineage, she finds herself in such an American tree with such shallow roots, barely reaching even to Whitman and Poe. But then what of Williams? In one of the dialogues in Dr. Williams' heiresses, Notley writes that Williams allowed you to be fast, perky, sassy, talky, all these different ways that had to do with talking in one poem. He helped you be as fast as you are and to consolidate these voices you were hearing in your head and in the house and on the street and put them in the same poem. I'm in agreement with Notley here. There's something charming about William's fast, perky, sassy talkiness, even when the content of his statements is far from. He helps us to be as fast as we are, even though I usually like to be slow. He helps us to consolidate the voices we hear into one poem. But Notley also writes in the same dialogue, the thing about William Carlos Williams is, aside from the fact that he talked and wrote in this very particular way, he sets himself up to be this character of the American male in this way. So if you're a woman, you can relate to him in this way, where you'll be the woman, the typical American woman character. 
He made himself to be this character so that you can make yourself to be this other character, the polar opposite of him. It enables you to have access to his secrets and to his diction and to his ways of thinking. I don't know, there's this way to be yourself, a woman and a person, that has a lot to do with William Carlos Williams. Really? Maybe this is another case where the generous reading of Notley's essay would historicize it and find something feminist and empowering about this claim. But to get a sense of the influence of Williams, I'd have to point out that I don't want a character of the American male around whom I can fashion myself as the typical American woman character. I find Notley's pulls reductive, not only for their essentialist constructions of gender, but also for their imagination that the polar opposite of one character imagined in a specifically national way is merely a character of the same nationality, but the opposite sex. And this gets to the real crux of why I think Williams is important to think about. The poet of everyday observation and of the local, the documentarian of Patterson, offers much in terms of giving poets a way to think through their place, their location in social space, the language of that space, and how it can become the language of their work. But the reception of Williams and the Williams of In the American Grain suggests something quite different. Is there something aggressive about this local, something nationalistic? The mocking tones of a short poem like The Chinese Nightingale, where Williams creates a rude juxtaposition between the conventionally poetic title and the popularized short haikuish form, and its prosaic description of the immigrant Sam Wu working late at night suggests that Williams Local might contain multitudes, but isn't truly characterized by them. Even with this in mind, though, I still want Williams. So the question becomes, who's the Williams I want? In an attempt at an answer, I turn to spring and all. In passing with my mind, on nothing in the world, but the right of way I enjoy on the road by virtue of the law. I saw an elderly man who smiled and looked away to the north past a house, a woman in blue, who was laughing and leaning forward to look up into the man's half averted face and a boy of eight who was looking at the middle of the man's belly at a watch chain. The supreme importance of this nameless spectacle sped me by them without a word. Why bother where I went? For I went spinning on the four wheels of my car along the wet road until I saw a girl with one leg over the rail of a balcony. Thanks.